you've said in interviews, and you just said it before, that children would take to reptiles if it weren't for their parents. Um, and that's not the case in your life. Um, is that more or less true across the world? And how do some people at a young age choose a snake to be a friend with, rather than a box full of marbles? Like, with, I'm politely asking if you have to be eccentric to love snakes at a young age. Well, I used to play with marbles too when I was about, you know. <laughs> but, no, I, um, yeah, that's a, a really good question. First of all, parents are protective about their kids, and quite rightfully so. There are some venomous species of snakes, as there are some insects. I mean, you certainly don't want a kid playing around with a scorpion, whereas, you know, a beetle or something like that is a perfectly acceptable pet or something to at least observe close up. So it's a question of teaching kids what's safe and what's not safe. So it takes a little bit of extra effort. But I think that extra effort is worth it because that can open a whole world of of a fascinating life to the kid for the rest of his life in terms of you know being close to nature and not being scared of things so it's a wonderful opportunity for the parents have to get kids into that I, yeah uh, Ram, I mean, we've spoken about snakes and I want to take you to ghariyals in a while. But before that, you know, while you were talking about children and getting them uh, interested in, in animals and creepy crawlies, uh, what do you have to say about the state of zoos in India in particular? Hmm. Have we missed a trick there in our inability to really draw and keep young children interested and show them this fascinating world? Yeah. I to get into a discussion of zoos would be a little awkward right now. I mean, we operate one of the large zoos in the country, which is the Madras Crocodile Bank, uh, with 2,500 animals there, and we try to look after them as best we can. I, I know that some zoos are much better than others, and some of them don't really add up to the mark. One of the uh, sad things which has happened recently is that um, we are no longer allowed to uh, allow a child to touch a snake, for example. And I, I can understand why this ruling came about, because people would mishandle a snake or, or even a baby crocodile. When we put a rubber band around a crocodile's nose, people objected, saying, no, that must be very harmful to it. So I replaced the rubber band with a pink ribbon, hoping that that would uh, <laughs> alleviate the, the criticism. But I, I do understand why that ruling is there. But uh, on the other hand, it's used worldwide, that, and uh, it does work, that if a child gets to touch a snake along with a good explanation of C, it, it's absolutely dry, clean, wonderful to the touch. It just opens up a whole world of excitement to that kid, and, and they're not allowed to do that anymore here. I wish that could be somehow changed. And, and, and the zoo, of course, does perform a wonderful function for the millions of city goers particularly who never really get an opportunity to see animals close up. So if it's done well, a zoo is a really good thing to have, yes. But it's got to be done well. Yeah. Ram, uh, you launched on Project Gharial, I think, and that was because you felt it was a huge danger yeah. as to what we were doing to our rivers, and it was telling a much bigger story than just conserving yeah. Gharials. Yeah. So could you take us a bit into the Gharial world and what prompted you to to do that, and I have a, a sort of related question. Uh, I mean, the, the tiger is also under a lot of stress, and some of my friends, uh, you know, tiger enthusiasts are here. But do you think that we've kind of got a little too carried away with the tiger question to worry about other species, and we've sort of, uh, you know, focused too much on the tiger? I mean, not that we've done very, very much as much as we should have, but we've lost track of the other big species that need help. It it, it is true to some extent. Um, we, we could say we're all in competition with each other for the interests of, of, of people and the support of people for different species. But yeah, uh, as far as the gharial is concerned, uh, it kind of epitomizes um, today um, clean rivers. Uh, the so-called unholy river of the Chumbal is one of the cleanest large rivers, if not the cleanest large river we have left in the country. Isn't that a fantastic irony that, that our holy rivers, the Ganga and the Yamuna, are amongst the filthiest rivers in the world. And Gharial can't live very well there anymore. There are a few coming back, luckily, thanks to uh, the help from World Wildlife Fund and, and a lot of very, uh, very dedicated uh, people with Wildlife Institute of India and other people. But the, 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 the Chumbal is really the last 
safe repository for the, for the gharial. We're sad to say, not only that, the river dolphin and many species of turtles and fish and so on. So it is kind of an irony that uh, it's, it's, it's not a river which is considered one of the holy rivers, and, and yet it's still intact. So uh, I, I did surveys of crocodiles back in the early 1970s and found that uh, we, we have three species in India, the mugger, the freshwater crocodile, the gharial, and the saltwater crocodile. And all three of them, especially the gharial, were very close to extinction. And this prompted the government of India to start Project Crocodile under uh, the prime ministership of Indira Gandhi. And with the help of the Food and Agriculture Organization, a specialist came over. And we started uh, a very strong conservation uh, project for crocodiles. The, another irony of it is that we've been so successful that crocodiles are literally bouncing back. You've all heard about the Andaman Islands, you've heard about Gujarat, and you've heard now more recently about Tamil Nadu, where crocodile numbers are increasing, attacks are increasing, and now we have to educate people how to live with crocodiles, not how to conserve them, how to live with them. So we're falling into a, a similar trend which has happened in other parts of the world. And it's, it's really up to us so-called conservationists to get on that bandwagon and get people to understand how to live with these animals. They are big predators, after all. Yeah. Rob, you uh, investigated some gharials who were falling sick very dramatically. And you, w you did some uh, stuff and you figured that they had a case of gout. Yeah. And how, uh, what was affecting just the gharials and seemed like a problem away from our lives was actually kind of a pre-warning to what would happen to humans and other consumers of that water. So could you take us a bit through that? that that's time? probably taking the story even further than I was, would be able to say because there was no proof of exactly why or how this happened. And it seemed like a single toxic event. The, uh, the early uh, symptoms of gout we felt were from a, a, I mean, a, what they call a toxic incident. And we felt that perhaps they're going down to the Yamuna River and eating fish which are in incredibly full of heavy metals and all sorts of things, and then uh, r resulting in the, in the illness that, that kills uh, more than 100 gharial at that time. It turns out that's not so at all. Uh, it turns out that it's more likely that something was actually dumped off one of the rivers that crosses the, the, uh, the uh, Chamba and uh, somehow got into the either into the fish or into directly into the gharial, and that's what happened. It's still a bit of a mystery, but it still shows that how vulnerable a species can be to a toxic event like that. Just to stay on the gharial a little bit, is that you also remarked that uh, it is known that the gharial sort of never went extinct. It kind of, it is one of the oldest creatures alive. And mm. you've also spoken about the immense intelligence that, that crocodiles have yeah. and that gharials have. So uh, just, just explain a little bit about what, you know, what is that kind of intelligence that you, you, yeah, know, I, you saw? Yeah, what's absolutely amazing is uh, the, what happened at the, um, in, in a place called the, uh, uh, an alligator farm in Florida called St. Augustine Alligator Farm, they started a croc school. They started teaching crocodiles to do various things the way you teach dogs to do various things. And uh, a friend of ours, Sohan Mukherjee, who works in Gujarat with animal uh, rescues and stuff, was working for us then, and he started to train our crocodiles. We started out with Ali the alligator. She was already a very friendly alligator. And then we included a saltwater crocodile, a Siamese crocodile, and a Cuban crocodile. We have quite a few different species there. While he was teaching Ali to come, to go, to open mouth, to sit down, to stand up, to do things like you would teach a dog, the other crocs were watching Ali getting her treats. And we didn't know it then, but they were learning these same tricks without getting the treats. Now that took crocodile intelligence reams further than we had ever realized they were capable of. And it turns out they are very smart indeed. And relating that to what the gharial are doing now, a friend of ours called Jeffrey Lang, who's been working with us for the last 30 years on crocodiles in India, he comes from the States, comes over here. He's sitting on the chumbal in 45 degree weather right now, uh, watching the hatching which is taking place uh, uh, on the chumbal. All the gharial babies are, this week, will probably start emerging from their eggs. And uh, he has found out that the male gharial is the one who takes most of the care of the hatchlings. And one male will look after 
a, a crash of up to a thousand baby burial. Some of you may have seen the recent photographs in the uh, BBC Wildlife, and perhaps there have been other places where these photographs have been shown, where a, a male gharial with a whole bunch of babies sitting around on its head, are absolutely incredible pictures. And this is the male who will very often chase the females and we say, forget it, you guys have done your job, now it's my turn to look at <laughs> And if a jackal or if a, a bird of prey or a, a, a white-necked stork, anything comes nearby, he'll chase them, protecting these babies. Uh, Jeff calls them super dads, and I, I go with that. I promise to voluntarily come to the snake park next time I'm in Madras. Please do. <laughs> I invite our chief editor, Mr. Raj Kamalja, to give you a small thank you gift. <laughs>